Welcome to Oxford Baptist Church. My name is Cam Van Bemmel, and I am one of the elders here at the church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. Here at Oxford, we believe a relationship with Jesus Christ changes everything. I just want to remind you of a few things coming up at the church. Prayer time happens every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Youth grades 9 to 12 continue to meet at The Rock on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 9.30, and grades 6 to 8 meet at The Rock on Thursday evenings from 6.30 to 8.30. If you need more information on these meetings, please check out oxfordbaptist.ca under Youth Ministries. Our ladies are also holding a ladies' night out on April 1st at The Rock. It will be a time to enjoy having fun together after a long time of having to separate. Please register for this event at oxfordbaptist.ca. Our Dal Rod team begins their practice for Easter Sunday, today after the morning service. This is open to anyone grade one and up, and we are really hoping for a multi-generational team. Please come out for this new ministry opportunity. Also, don't forget about our March Giving Madness Challenge from our building campaign. It's a great time to do some spring cleaning and donate to the building fund, and you get a chance to win a prize. Today is YFC Sunday, when we will hear from missionaries from Youth for Christ that work here in Woodstock with our youth. Pastor Tyler will also continue our series in Jonah. May God bless you today and open your heart to what he has to teach you. Your hands, all you nations, 
David Sealing, and this is my wife, Nancy. Hi. I remember in the 60s when I was in high school and a Youth for Christ director used to come to our club. We had a Christian club in the school and we were always impressed with him because he gave up his time freely and was a really, really neat guy. Youth for Christ has always been um, something that we love. When your turnover is different students every four years, the culture changes all the time. That's difficult to adjust to, but I've seen Youth for Christ adapt very well to these changing demographics and to provide programs that engage the youth and who ultimately were used to show them who the person of Christ is. As I said, I started coming out to Youth for Christ as a student and I saw the difference that it made in the lives of the people around me. One of my favorite memories was a student who came in all huffy and, and angry the one week and she was going on about this insult that someone had, had given to her and her family and she said, man, if this was four years ago, I would have just punched them in the face. But because of you guys, I didn't do that. I gave them a warning. If they do it again, I'll punch them, but I didn't do it today. And it was just such a funny memory of the, the slow work that ministry can be. And I appreciate that Youth for Christ has been there for the long haul in the community. Well, IFC, without a doubt, is one of the finest organizations that I know of. Between the young people that we have that work with the youth, and you'll always hear me say that they are urban missionaries. All we have to do is turn around and look of the streets of our cities. We have youth that are struggling, looking for direction, looking for companionship, someone to talk to, someone to help lead the way. And our missionaries, our young missionaries, they're doing that. And oh my gosh, what an amazing job they do. So my name is David Armstrong, and a lot of you know me already because I attend Oxford Baptist Church. But today I get to be here as a missionary with Youth for Christ. So our chapter is called Southwestern Ontario Youth for Christ, and we're also known as Youth Unlimited YFC, Southwestern Ontario. So you might hear both names in the community. I am the Director of Financial Services for Southwestern Ontario Youth for Christ, and I work in an office right here in Woodstock on Graham Street. And I've been doing that for about 24 years, so I've seen a lot of changes over those years. Basically what I do is an, I'm part of an administrative team and so I look after overseeing the financial systems and all the 
donations coming in and the expenses going out and anything to do with the accounting for uh, about 80 staff in about 24 locations, give or take, at any given time around southwestern Ontario. The videos that you just saw were made by our staff in YFC Tri-City. So that's one of our satellite locations, and that one is based in Cambridge. And the people in that video were talking specifically about the ministries that we have there in YFC Tri-City. In general, our field staff work to help young people, to, to uh, develop relationships with young people all over southwestern Ontario. And really, the sky's the limit. You can get as creative as you want to get when it comes to developing ways of reaching out to youth uh, wherever they are. We want to do things that they're interested in. We want to get to know them. And we want to earn the right to speak into their lives and find opportunities to share the message of Jesus with them. And that's what our staff out in the field do, whether it's just living their lives involved with these young people or it's actually verbally sharing the gospel with them. That's what our goal is. So I want to just give a couple of stories uh, because typically people aren't really all that excited to hear about what I do in the financial and accounting work at Youth for Christ. So I like to ask what's going on out there and it really is a pleasure for me to go to our staff meetings and to hear about what's going on on the front lines of ministry with youth. So what I've brought to you today is a couple of just quick testimonials that I'm going to read for you from my co-workers. A co-worker of mine named Aaron at YFC Minto, so that's Minto Township, about a couple hours north and west of here, Harriston and Palmerston area. He has a story where he says, we have a program called AIM, that stands for Archery in Motion, and here are two emails we received. So this one's first one is from a parent. The parent says, I wanted to write and thank you for the Archery in Motion initiative. Jay had a great time. Your devotionals really spoke to him as well. He asked some great questions on the ride home, and we were able to share more of the gospel with him. And then a separate story from a grandparent this time about another kid in the program said, she loved learning and looks forward to learning more. It is so beautiful to see her proud of herself in accomplishing something for a change. Thanks for doing this program. And then one other area, so this is from Tanya. She's the director of our Tri-City area. She says, a mom reached out in desperation for her son who has Asperger's. So just in case you don't know, Asperger's is a certain type of autism. So for her son who has Asperger's, who needed a place to go to find hope, to say he was struggling with online learning would be an understatement. After enrolling in our auto repair program, the mom began to see her son once again have joy. He finally felt like he could accomplish something and that brought hope and peace into their family. Praise God for allowing us to connect and positively impact a family's life during a very difficult time. So not only am I reading a couple of these stories to you, but I'm actually excited to tell you I have a couple of my coworkers here with me today, and they're going to come and speak to you in just a moment. But before they do, I want to leave you with a prayer request or two from me personally, from where I sit at Youth for Christ. So my number one prayer request continues to be that we would find a new accounting clerk. That's a very important role right in our office. The person would be working with me. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of education and knowledge ahead of time. We can train the person just in case you or someone you know is interested. Uh, but the person would need to have skills in the area of numbers and computers and organizing. So we still haven't found a person to fill that role yet. Now you do have to sit beside me, so I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. I'm not sure. But uh, please be praying for that. That's, that's a very important one. 
And also just speaking from my role in the office, that you would pray that those of us who do the administration and work in the office each day would have a fresh awareness of God's presence with us and God's purpose for what it is that we're doing as part of this work. And finally, I just want to thank you as my Oxford Baptist Church family for the privilege that it is for me to come and be part of your family, but also be one of the missionaries that's supported by the church. That's just a great support through your prayers, through your encouragement, and through your financial giving as well. So I'm going to pass it on to Kelly, and she's going to come up and talk a bit about what's going on right here at YFC Woodstock. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly Rigglesworth, although some of you may remember me as Kelly Simmons. So, um, in my, or my kids, Avery and Foster, who were very, very small and are now very, very big. Um, I'm one of the lucky few who actually gets to work at both Southwestern Ontario. Um, it's also affectionately called SWO um, because Youth Unlimited YFC Southwestern Ontario is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so I help out there in the office half of my time. And I help out with the HR, so I actually work out work with Dave in the office. We do, I do job compliance, and I also manage the the summer students. This year, we're going to have over 30 summer students that will be helping out with our various satellites. So that in itself is a pretty much a full time job from about May until October. So um, it's amazing to watch these kids come in and see how they impact the youth that they work as well as how they are impacted by those that are mentoring them over the course of the summer. Um, so that's half of my time and the other half of my time I actually work with Youth Unlimited YFC Woodstock and so I'm super lucky that I get to have those two different teams that I work with and be able to support. Um, before COVID when I came on with uh, YFC Woodstock I, my ministry was mostly music. I was a music director for K2K and I was doing voice lessons. Um, COVID threw that up in the air just like it did with everything else. And uh, I spent a lot of time um, praying for where God wanted me to go from there and what, that, what his vision was for Woodstock. Um, and over that time, I was given the vision of a table. And uh, I wasn't sure what that was gonna look like and what that was gonna mean. Um, but uh, I was really struck by how much of Jesus' ministry was having meals with people when he, that he was trying to reach and how much of his ministry happened around a table and around food. And I know that the gift of hospitality um, is just very prevalent throughout the, the Gospels and the New Testament. Um, so I started thinking about how we could use that to reach out to the youth in Woodstock. And most of COVID was spent building a foundation for what that was going to look like. Um, we did a four week trial run just before Christmas and realized there really is huge need for this in Woodstock. Um, and so we were super excited that uh, in February we were able to launch um, the table, as you can see there. Um, we are getting 30 to 40 students. Um, we hold it once a week on Tuesdays at uh, First Baptist Church. And the kids are coming out. Um, they are super excited to have a home-cooked hot meal, and uh, so the teenage boys are like really, really appreciative, <laughs> when, especially when they come back for thirds and fourths, and we say, that's okay, you can have some more, have as much as you would like, so um, it's amazing. Um, there's, they are starting to open up, and I know, although I don't have stats about uh, their, the demographics, I do know from conversations that many of them are not associated with the church, um, so we are definitely building those relationships and drawing them in and we've started to see some crossover of students coming from um, the table and then uh, attending our drop-ins and, and other programs that Adam's going to share with you that he's running. Um, so we're definitely seeing an impact. Um, we see how much they appreciate having a dry, warm place in the winter to come and share a meal with their friends. Um, and so we're, we're excited to be able to offer that for them. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's been a short time, 
But the fact that it's happened so quickly, we were thinking we might start with 10 or 15 students. The fact that we're at 30 or 40 consistently is definitely a God thing. And we know that this is, is God working in our, in our city and with our youth. Um, and so I, I'm excited that you are partnering with us to make this happen. Um, one of the big prayer requests that I would say is that uh, volunteers are always something that we can definitely use. Um, I cook a meal for 50 kids on Monday afternoons pretty much by myself. So if anybody wants to come out and help me cook, I would gladly have that. Um, also, if you have donations of food, um, last week we had 40 loaves of bread donated. The kids love the grilled cheese. So anything that you, if you are aware of something, um, please send them my way. Um, thank you so much for everything that you guys do in the community and how you support us. Um, and as always, praying for the youth that we are reaching, that, um, that those relationships are built, that uh, the connections that we make are deep and meaningful, and that they are open to the word of Christ. Um, and I'm going to invite Adam up, and he's going to talk about many of our other programs because he does a lot. So um, the next slide we'll see is the city race. Um, and this is something that the youth from here were involved in as well. And uh, I was involved with the, the food program. We had a, a couple of lunch spots, so the kids were able to come and, and get the fuel that they needed to continue on with the race. It was a long day, it was a hot day. Uh, the kids were amazing, they did so much. Um, but we're really excited for what this is going to become um, this year as a, an annual thing. Um, I'm gonna pass this over. Yeah, just saying, she uh, um, does an amazing job with the table, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to show up on the Tuesdays to hang out with the students, but uh, I am not allowed in the kitchen. <laughs> so, um, my name is Adam Wetlaufer. I am the Sports Ministry Director for YFC Woodstock. Um, I look after, um, basically my job title is I go and build programs in sport and social clubs uh, so youth can come out and uh, for a uh, subsidized cost, come out and hang out with us and participate in sports and get to know who Jesus is. Um, so City Race, uh, Kelly touched on it a little bit. Um, City Race is was awesome. It was a, a fun-filled day, eight stations. Uh, we had Nerf guns. We had, um, we had uh, treasure hunting. We had... Uh, brain teasers, so many cool things were going on that day. Um, we we only had, I, th I think it was three teams, four teams that came out uh, of the 16 that we were hoping for. But in those four teams, the right people showed up. It was so awesome to see them work together. We sorted out teams, so we had strangers with other teams, and we kind of moved some people around. And to see Jesus move in that was amazing. Um, so that was the city race. The next one we had was our um, open sky. So uh, unlike Kelly, I didn't have. I had a home base kind of already set out for me. Uh, Paul Dreyer did an amazing job setting up uh, open sky initially for that Ninja Warrior facility. So I was able to come in and kind of move some things around. And literally, I didn't have to start from scratch um, and was just able to build programs out of open sky. And so now we do things. Uh, we have PA days. We have March break camps. Um, we host uh, the original programming for Ninja Warrior facility. Uh, we have drop-ins that we have there. Uh, and we just have the doors open a lot more. And it's amazing to see people coming in off the street not knowing who we are or what we do and being able to be uh, plugged right in um, and be jumping around on the equipment and having an opportunity to build relationships with with those youth so that is open sky uh, and then we have our PA days next I was talking a little bit about it and now the PA days this is uh, I have a couple I have one story that comes out of a PA day camp so usually in our PA day camps when we have nutrition breaks of course it's opportunities to do some coloring and drawing and we have this one student that has uh, been to almost every single thing we've done um, including our pop-ups our PA day camps our um, um, our programming, general programming, and our drop-in nights. And he, he came up to uh, Mark and I and was talking about how he doesn't believe in this Jesus thing. It's just not for him. And Mark and I were like, that's okay. We can, we can, we can talk about it. We can open up conversation to that. And, you know, 
soon enough we find that this he's opening the Bible every single day. He's the first one to get a Bible off the shelf. He's the first one to flip through when we're doing um, we're doing races. He's the first one to find um, to hunt down those Bible verses for us. And and so we can clearly see that Jesus is using those opportunities to impact those students and to work with those students. And so that's that just gives you um, a little bit of an idea of what we get to do and um, who we get to impact. Uh, so ministry is running. Uh, I kind of touched a little bit on this. So we do have pop-ups. Uh, that is where we go out to um, different quadrants in the city and typically run in the spring and summer months. And we go and we play, um, we go to parks and we play basketball with students hanging out at the parks. We go and we play soccer and football and smash ball and all kinds of different cool activities. And we find out what, what is the up and up with a youth and we, we go out and hang out and play with them. Uh, we have the PA days, the March break camps, where uh, we have students come in and hang out with us. The OSA program, so again, we're opening doors where the kids can come in at any time during those times. In the summer, we're going to open it Monday to Friday um, from 10 till 3, where students can come in all day and hang out with us all day. Um, in the future ministries, uh, um, we have YFC, Woodstock, volleyball. Uh, is something that we are looking to get off the ground. We have about 29 students signed up for that. Where uh, in and amongst COVID, unfortunately, we have lost two years worth of uh, worth of sports and activities and extracurriculars in school. And so we have students that are trying to either in public school trying to go play volleyball in high school, and we have high school students that are looking to go on and play volleyball in college. And so we're hoping to kind of use that and fill some of that void for them. Uh, and coaching opportunities, something else that uh, I'm getting involved in is coaching in minor hockey uh, and minor sports in the city. And basically at one point in time I was talking about doing leagues and that is uh, volunteers and uh, a lot of head work into that. And Woodstock actually has a really good setup for leagues already. And so one of the programs that we want to start to kind of help out with that is not only building coaching, and building up in coaches, uh, three-dimensional coaching, which is know your, know your sport, know your, um, sorry, know your sport, know your emotion, know your faith, and uh, the next thing that we kind of want to build with that is, um, which is the word uh, subsidizing. So we are uh, looking to subsidize some of those sports. So youth can come and apply with us, and we will cover some of the cost or all of the cost for some of our youth to be involved in those sports. Uh, the next one is, um, so our fundraisers, um, touched a little bit on the city race. Last year, the city race was set up for uh, youth and youth alone. This year, we're setting it up as more of a, um, more of everybody can be involved. We're looking to get all the families involved and shifting it more into a, a fundraiser uh, slash still competing for that trophy. Uh, Oxford Baptist, you guys are the winners last year, so now you can talk your parents into coming out and playing and holding up that trophy together. Um, and our golf tournament uh, is in the summer where you guys can come out and chat with us a little bit more about what we're doing and what our plans are and of course our fall banquet. Um, the next slide is how you can find us, uh, which is a, a really good question. Um, you can find us on our link tree, which basically is set up that you can all our registration forms and uh, um, even how to get to our Instagram, Facebook, and websites. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at YFC Woodstock. Uh, you can also uh, access everything on our website at uh, yfcwoodstock.com. And everything interworks with each other, so you can easily find and fill out those registration forms and find out more information about our programs. And the last thing is how you can support. Um, prayer is huge. Uh, prayer is the number one way you can support us for sure. Um, there's a lot happening in the world today, and uh, not only us as uh, ministry staff uh, need prayer, but our youth need prayer. Uh, volunteering is the next one up. Uh, we always can use volunteers. We can always use helping hands in all of our programs. And uh, of course, financially, um, yes, we all, we all can use uh, financial support, uh, including all our stuff comes out of our general fund for our programs. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. I think Tyler, it's nice to meet everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, here's Tyler. There is healing in the power of
verses 16 through 19 together. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evil duders? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought, my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul.
I have uh, grown used to my way of life. I like the familiarity. I know my place in society, my reputation, my rights and privileges, all of which are comfortable to me. <laughs> Behold, I am a person of some prominence. My name is Jonah. I am a prophet of God. I served the Lord faithfully during the reign of Jeroboam II. Through God, I prophesied to the nation of Israel that the territory boundaries were going to be expanded. My ministry was fulfilled. I preached expansion, and it happened. I had great public success in the economic and military glory days of the Northern Kingdom. Then one day, <laughs> God's word came to me as it has before, and it stirred in me awe and wonder because it was more than just words. It was a profound experience of God's presence and power. My call to be a prophet was being reaffirmed and validated. My faithfulness to God and my loyalty to the nation was being confirmed. Jonah, yes, my Lord, Jonah, son of Amittai, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their evil has come up before me. What? Oh, no, no. Shock waves exploded in my mind. My heart sunk when I heard his command. Oh, he, he can't mean Nineveh. No, 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 it's not possible. It cannot be Nineveh, the capital city of Israel's avowed enemy. I am a prophet of Israel. I preach territorial expansion and good news. I have no desire to go to Assyria. I have no desire to go overland to Assyria. My Lord, we are the favored nation. Why would you care about Assyria? Without hesitation, I got up, ran in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. I went out to the seaport. I went to the port of Joppa. I found a ship heading for Tarshish. I bought a ticket and went on board, hoping that going west, I could escape from the Lord. As soon as I got on the ship, I went down to the hold. <sighs> yeah, that ought to do it. <laughs> I think God's got the message. You can find someone else to do the job. Better yet, why not just destroy the city? Save us a lot of trouble. It's been a long journey, and I grew weary. And it was there that I fell into a deep sleep. Suddenly, the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Oh, the desperate sailors cried out to their gods and threw cargo overboard to lighten the ship. They remembered that I was down in the hold, so the captain went down after me. How can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll pay attention to us and spare our lives. The sailors then decided to cast lots to see which one of them had offended their gods and caused this terrible storm. Well, the lot fell on me. Why has this awful storm come down on us? And who are you? I am a prophet of God. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who created the sea and the land. Oh, when the sailors heard this, they were terrified. And, they and since the storm was getting worse, they asked me, what should we do to you to stop this terrible storm? Well, throw me into the sea. It will become calm again. For I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. 
Oh, when the sailors heard this, they cried and pleaded to the Lord, do not let us die for this man's sin, and do not hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, we know that you had brought this storm down on him for your own good reasons. So the sailors picked me up and threw me into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. To be continued. Well, thank you, Mike, for presenting that that way to us. That was awesome. As we begin this morning, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your awesome and great word that we get to open this morning. We thank you, God, that it is full of truth, that it cuts deep to the heart. And I pray, God, that as we explore this first chapter of Jonah, you would show us our own hearts. God, that you would show us your heart and that you would help our heart to, to be an image of yours, to reflect what you do. God, we know that you are a God who saves. And as we see in this book, we don't always have the same heart as you. And I pray, God, that as we open it this morning, you would soften our hearts to the world around us and we would see the great hope of Jesus Christ and how it is for all people. And we pray this in your name. Amen. This morning, as I start, I just want to thank everyone for their prayers as we were away last weekend. Uh, we were able to make it to and from the retreat and go skiing and do everything we, we did over the weekend. Nobody got injured. We praise the Lord for that. Uh, but we also had some awesome spiritual conversations, just really challenged by God's word about what it means to be made new and how God sees us today. And so uh, you can just continue to pray for our students as they chew on what they heard. On Wednesday and Thursday this week, we kind of did a question and answer night, so they heard a little bit more. But I just thank you for your prayers as uh, you prayed for us this past weekend. Jonah is an awesome story. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And as we start today, let's just read chapter 1 together. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it so uh, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish." And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us, on whose account is this evil, on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And, what, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon us. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood for you. The Lord, O Lord, have mercy, or Lord, sorry, O Lord, have done, the, have done as you please. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and having a sacrifice and, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Oftentimes when we read stories, we put ourselves into them. That's really what Mike did as he started. He put his, himself into the character of the story. And that's even more true as we read stories throughout Scripture because God often invites us to join inside the story, to take the perspective of one of the characters so that he can teach us something. We see Jesus teach this way all the time. If you think of the, the parable of the lost son, for example, we see in that awesome parable that we are supposed to represent the son who has gone away and come back and we receive grace and mercy from the father. And it's just an awesome picture. And we're supposed to put ourselves in that story. I think the same is true of what we find here in the book of Jonah. God calls us, I think as we read this, we are supposed to see ourselves in this story, this accurate account of what actually happened to the prophet named Jonah, but it applies to us today. The ultimate character, as we go through, we realize that we are Jonah. We are Jonah. And when you think of the book of Jonah, most people immediately think of, yeah, the story of the big fish, the story of the whale. I mean, even Veggie Tales, it's Jonah and the whale. That's what the book is really about. But as we go through this book, we ultimately see that this story is not about Jonah. This story is not about Nineveh. This story is not about a big fish. This story is all about God. About God and his heart for people, the way that he cares for people, the way that he desires for them to be saved. And so as we open and read through these verses this morning, I want you to keep that in mind. This is a story about God and who God is, and how he wants to work. Let's dive in together. In verses 1 to 3, we see God's mission. The mission of God. Let's read verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, so here we see Jonah, the prophet of the Lord. And last week, I, I, Robin went through and kind of gave us a little bit of background uh, we know that Jonah was a prophet. We saw in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, that he, God had used him as a prophet before, spoken to him, given him, given him instruction on how he was to live. And so uh, God had told him specifically to shore up the northern borders from the Assyrian army. The king, Jeroboam II, listened. He did that, and the people were saved. And as a result, Jonah really was this national hero, prophet, bringing good news from the Lord. Jonah had been, ultimately, you could say, called by God to be his messenger, called by God to be his own. Verse 2, the command he receives, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. We are told specifically that this called man Jonah now receives word from God, a clear command. And the command that he receives is go to Nineveh and tell them of the coming judgment. Go there. Let them know that their sin is a big deal. And as we saw last week and as uh, Mike also pointed out, Assyria was the capital, like Assyria, the, the great army of, that was against the northern kingdom of Israel, their capital city was Nineveh. So this was a big deal. Go to the capital city of the great army and, and, and preach and tell them of the coming judgment. God sends Jonah there because he loves those people. Because God cares about those people. Because he is a God compassionate and gracious and merciful. That's why he sends it. That's his heart for the people of Nineveh. Even though they are, as history recounts, known as very vile, just terrible people. They were brutal in war. That's what they, they, they were known for. They are not known as good people, but God loves them and wants to give his word to them. He wants to show them mercy. In verse 3, we see his response. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. It's never good, is it, when we see a command from God and then the next word right after that is but, is it? Jonah hears God's word, and he runs away. 
he hears God's command and he runs away. And how foolish is it for Jonah to believe really that he can outrun God, right? We know that God is everywhere. We know that God is, is awesome and big and great and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, but the fact is we often do that sometimes, don't we? We often think, I can outrun God. God's told me to do this or not to do this, and I'm disobeying, but I think I can outrun him. Jonah then goes and gets on a boat and goes literally in the opposite direction. It's like getting on the 401, being told to go to Toronto, and then jumping on and heading to Windsor. It's the exact same east-west. That's exactly what he was doing, going the complete way God had told him not to go. Let's compare ourselves to Jonah here for a minute. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you too have been called. Romans chapter 8 verse 30 says, For those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's because you have been called by God, just like Jonah was. Not only have we been called, but... Just like Jonah has been given a command, we too have been given a command, haven't we? Matthew chapter 8, or 28, sorry, verses 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Jesus speaking. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. Our command is to go to the nations, to share this gospel, this great news that we have all heard about what Jesus Christ has done with the people around us in our local context and then out to all nations. It's supposed to go and spread. And that is the command that we have been given. Not not a, uh, you should maybe do this, but a command, just like Jonah was given a command. And what has your response been to this command? What is it today? What is your response to this command? Have you been running away from God and his call in your life to go and share the gospel? Have you decided that, you know what, I just don't need to make disciples. It's, it's not my job. We, we have a church. We pay people at the church to do that job. We have missionaries. We pay our missionaries to do that job. I don't need to go and make disciples. We're going to jump forward a little bit in the story here. And ultimately, we're going to see the scariest thing. And that's the reason why Jonah decides to run away. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Why does Jonah decide that he he is going to disobey God's command? Chapter 4, verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah. So just for a bit of context, he's gone to Nineveh now. He's preached the the word, and the people have turned and repent. And at the end of chapter 3 there, it says that God relents from the disaster that's planned. He has mercy on them because of the repentance of Nineveh. And now Jonah says, but, he was dis- but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said to you when I was yet in my country? So this conversation has already actually happened. We get it now in chapter 4, but it did happen before he even left. That, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. He says it right there. This is why I ran away. This is why. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, O Lord, please take my life for me, for it is better for me to die than live. This is how angry Jonah is. And he's angry. He didn't want to go in the first place, and he's angry because he knew who God was. He knew all along that God was gracious. He knew all along that God was merciful, that God was loving. He knew that God would save them if he went and repented. And he didn't want that. He didn't want them to be saved. He hated Nineveh so much. He had such a strong hate for Nineveh that he didn't want their salvation. He hated them so much that he wanted them to face, the Nineveh people to face the judgment of God. He didn't want God to show mercy to them. Is that our heart for people today? It might seem a little bit harsh, but let me read you this story from David Platt. He says this, I was going to preach one Sunday morning on making disciples to all nations. On Saturday night, Heather, my wife, and I were sitting around with the pastor and his wife, two deacons and their wives. 
we were telling them of all the opportunities I had to go to different countries that were not easy to go into. Countries where people are often op- opposed to Christianity and opposed to the gospel. Difficult countries. We're sharing about this with one of the guys when the deacon sat up in his chair and said, Dave, I think it's great that you're going to all those places. But if you ask me, I would just as soon God annihilate all those people and send them to hell. I know preachers have a tendency to exaggerate, but that's exactly what he said. I would just as soon God annihilate all of them and send them to hell. You ask me what my response was. I didn't say anything. I was stunned into silence. I didn't know what to say. The conversation ended up going on like nothing had happened. And I thought, okay, I'm going to preach on making disciples of all nations tomorrow. This is going to be interesting. So I got there Sunday morning. And I was there in the front row, and before I got up to preach, the pastor got up, and he had, was kind of welcoming folks, and I don't know what sparked it. It was not the 4th of July, but something patriotic, patriotic was aroused in him, and he began to talk how the, about how there was no chance he would ever live anywhere outside of the United States. He talked about how proud he was to be an American, and how thankful he was to live in this country and not another country. And amens were firing throughout the room, and I thought, all right, I'm about to preach to going to all nations. So I preached. I I hope I pray with as much grace as in me and Christ. And at the end, I was standing down in the front, and the pastor got up to close things out, and he said to me, before we leave, I want to say a couple things. David, we just want you to know that we are so thankful for all these places that you're going. And we want to promise you this morning that we will send you money so that we don't have to go to these places ourselves. His exact words. Heather's hand came on my shoulder. Sweat is beating down my neck, and he continues. At my last church, we had a, a, ministry, a missionary from Japan who came and spoke, and I told the church that if they didn't give him support in his missionary, uh, th- then, then I would pray that God would send his kids to go work with him in Japan. Like it was a threat. And he continued. My church gave that guy a laptop, all sorts of different things. Apparently the threat works. I got in my car that Sunday, and I drove away, and just a swell of emotions came over me. Anger, sadness, confusion. What if that deacon and that pastor simply said what most Christians in our context believe, but are just not bold enough to say? Lord, I pray that's not our heart. But I'm afraid sometimes it can be. Maybe the reason you aren't sharing the gospel with the nations, with the people in your context today, is because you know what God will do. You know that God will will save them. And you don't want that. Maybe there's people that have hurt you, and maybe you feel like they just don't deserve the gospel. And, And I mean, you're right, they don't. Nineveh didn't deserve God's grace. Your family members, your friends who've hurt you, they they don't deserve God's grace. Your co-workers They don't deserve God's grace. The countless people around this world who are persecuting our brothers and sisters in Christ, they don't deserve God's grace. But neither did Jonah. And neither did do you and I. Maybe that's where our hearts are this morning when it comes to sharing the gospel and bringing it to all nations. Maybe we really don't want people to be saved. And if that's the case, then I honestly... I urge you to spend more time re-examining the gospel. Who is Jesus? What has he done? Look at that. Because his heart is for the nations. It's for everyone. He wants people to come to him. We need to understand that by saying that, that's that's a big deal. We're saying we want people to spend eternity in hell by saying we don't want them to have the gospel. We won't, we don't, that's what our goal, our hope is for them. Maybe though, and this is where it gets harder, maybe though it's not our actions that say that we want the nations to face God's judgment, but our inaction, our failure to act. We don't specifically say, God, I want you to send all these people to hell, but we don't do anything in our lives to show otherwise. Isn't having a heart that says sharing the gospel is the job of others and I can pay them to do it, the same thing. Really? It's comfortable, it's easy to live in Canada, to spend time with our families, to go to our well-paying jobs with good working conditions and when we compare to the other rest of the world, that's, 
very true, to show up to church maybe once a week, maybe less, maybe more, to give a little bit on Sunday, and to let others handle the work of the Great Commission. What I'm not saying this morning is that everyone here needs to go home, pack all their stuff, sell it, and move to a country that no one's ever heard of before to tell them about Jesus. That's, that's not what I'm saying. My question, though, this morning is, have you asked God how he wants to use you for the gospel? Seriously. Have you gone before God and said, God, how do you want to use me? Have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you spent time in prayer by yourself, with your spouse, maybe with other brothers and sisters in Christ that you have a strong relationship and you know love Jesus? Have you done that and said, God, where do you want me to, use, to be used for your gospel? Do you have a limit on where God's allowed to use you? Jonah did. That limit was Nineveh. He said, no, anywhere but in here. Do we have a limit? Making sacrifices for the gospel is hard, and it often means giving something up, but we realize who Jesus is and what Jesus gave up for us, and it's worth it. Maybe making sacrifices for the gospel means you can't retire as early as, as you wanted. Maybe making sacrifices for the gospel means, you know what, you can't go on the vacation you wanted because instead of going to a beach, you decide, I'm going to go and I'm going to find one of our missionaries and I'm going to spend two weeks with them and see how I can serve and care and help them for two weeks. Maybe, maybe going and, and sharing the gospel means that you don't get to live around the corner from your children or grandchildren like you hoped. Think of our missionaries that are around the globe. Often they, they don't get to watch their kids and grandkids grow up. They've had to give that up. That's a good thing to watch that, but they gave it up. Are we, I'm not saying everyone needs to do that, but are we at least willing to do that? Are we at least willing to say, God, my life is yours. The things of this world I will put in your hands. Where do you want me? Maybe it means preparing somebody else to go. Uh, as, a, as a father, there's often times I have prayed for my boys. God, I want you to save them. I want you to use them for your glory. Maybe as a parent you've prayed that. God, save my kids. Make them yours. I want them to love you and serve you all the days of your life. If you're a parent, have you prayed that before? Right? But, but what if that means that they're going to go somewhere far away from you? What if that means they're going to go somewhere dangerous? What if that means God calls them to be martyred for the sake of the gospel? Is that, is that okay? Are we willing to give that up for the gospel? It's hard. It's not easy. Maybe you're called to just stay here right in Woodstock, and most of us probably are. Lead a Bible study, disciples, disciple other people, grow in your faith. But maybe that decision is, is going to just force you to have to give up the Ontario dream. And what I mean by that is I'm going to be able to go and move and live in somewhere warm half the year and come back for the summers and, and do that and, and retire at a nice age and just be able to travel and do all sorts of things when I get older. Maybe that's your, your dream you're looking forward to forward to those things. And, and, and maybe God's going to call you and say, you know what, I need you to be here in Woodstock to lead a study, to disciple people, and you can't do that six months a year. I need you 12. Jesus didn't give us the Great Commission because he knew it would be easy. He gave us the Great Commission because he knew it could only be accomplished through his Spirit. See, Jonah, he wanted the blessings of God without the obedience of God. And I think we can be like Jonah a lot. We want God's blessing without his obedience. Do you see the gospel is worth it? Do you realize that Jesus gave it all for you? He gave his life. God the Father gave his son for you on the cross. And now we're to give it all to him. My question for you this morning is, is our inaction, our failure to act, when we fail to place the gospel as the most important thing in our life, does that not say the same thing that that deacon and that pastor said? I just assumed they would all go to hell. I'm going to be honest, this has been weighing heavy on my heart this week. Because honestly, it, when we look at how we live our lives, how we share the gospel, 
who we share the gospel with. Is there anything more hateful that we can do as believers than fail to share the gospel with someone around us? If we believe that the gospel is what it is, that it saves people, that it will change their heart, it will change their lives today and forevermore, if we hold that back from them, what are we saying about how we care about them? And so today, I want you to just think about this. Pray about it. God, where are you calling me? God, my life is a blank check. What do you want me to do? I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go. And if not, God, change my heart so I am. Are you willing to prioritize the gospel? Make it the most important thing in your life. Make it more important than everything else. Make the sharing of the gospel essential. Jonah ran away from God because he hated those people. He disobeyed God's commands. We don't want to be Jonah. We'll continue the rest of this chapter next week along with chapter 2 as we close today. Will you submit yourself to Jesus Christ, to the gospel, to the necessity for it to go to all nations? Will you realize that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been commanded to be part of sharing the gospel? It's not a, something that you should maybe do or hopefully you'll do. It's a command. And will you spend time maybe today, maybe later this week, and ask God, God, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? Search his word, pray with him, talk to other believers. But seriously consider, what things have we put in our life that cause us to say, you know what, God, you can use me everywhere but here? Let's pray as we conclude this morning. God, your word sometimes is hard. God, we thank you that you are a gracious God. We see that through the rest of this book. You are a God who's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That, God, you are a God who loves the nations. We thank you, God, for the love that you have for all people, the love that we have received through Jesus Christ when we believe in you. We praise you, God, for the love that you give us. We are undeserving of it. God, I pray for all of us that we can seriously look at our lives, Look at the things that you have called us to, the things that we put in the way and say, this is more important than the gospel. God, will you remove those things from us? Will we be able to honestly come to you and say, here I am, use me. Wherever you want, doing whatever you want for your glory and honor. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ who gave it all for us. Will you change our hearts so that we can now give it all for you? In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy. Worship His holy.
Next week, we can continue with the last two chapters, or the last two sections that we had there, where we see God's awesome pursuit of Jonah and his grace. Because Jonah disobeyed, we disobey, but God pursues us and he has grace. It's not the end. We can go back. We can obey. He gives us another chance. We see that in the book. This morning, that was a challenging message. Like I said, it's been weighing on my heart. What are we doing for the gospel? And I pray that it's something you can honestly think about this week. God, where do you want us? My life is yours. It's a blank check. Let's pray as we conclude this morning. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that what he did on the cross was enough for our sins. We thank you that, Father, you were willing to give up your son for us. You gave it all. God, we want to give it all for you. God, will you use our church, the people of this church, our brothers and sisters in Christ in this city and around the world, will you use all of us and say to, to share your gospel where you need it? God, will our hearts and lives be a blank check open for you? We praise you, God, that we have the privilege to serve you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. If you saw the, the week, the weather looks wonderful. It's going to get warm. The clocks went back today, so we lost some sleep. But it's going to be light at like 7 o'clock tonight, which is going to be amazing. And then next Sunday is the first week of spring. Yeah. So God bless. Thanks for joining us here and online. And we will see you uh, this week or next Sunday. God bless.